Hi, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of Spectre Live. I'm Zach Levinson, and I'll be moderating today's discussion called Myanmar and the Regional, Stru uh, Regional Struggle for Democracy. As I'm sure you all know by now, on February 1st, the Burmese military seized power, ending Myanmar's short-lived experiment with democracy. Both President Nguyen Myen and State Councilor Aung San Suu Kyi were immediately taken into custody, and to date, over 700 civilians have been killed by the police and armed forces, and another 4,000 have been arrested. An indefinite general strike continues across multiple cities, and long-running ethnic minority insurgencies on the country's periphery are linking up with struggles in both cities and rural areas. So today we're fortunate to have an incredible lineup of speakers. We're gonna discuss the state of the resistance today, both in Myanmar and in the larger region. But before I introduce them, I wanna thank our sponsors today. So first and foremost, thanks to Haymarket for making this event happen, providing tech support and for everything they do. And I also wanna thank Spectre, which organized this event as part of the ongoing Spectre Live series. If you don't already know, Spectre is a new Marxist biannual print journal launched last May with our third issue arriving in subscribers' mailboxes in a few short weeks. We don't run with any foundation funding, and so we rely on, do on donations and subscriptions to keep us going. So please visit spectrejournal.com and help out with what you can, as running a print journal is a lot more expensive than you'd expect. Every little bit helps. Now, returning to the program, I'll be your host. So my name is Zach Levinson, I'm both an editor of Spectre and a sociology professor at UNC Greensboro in the US. Today we have a great lineup of speakers, including two specialists on Myanmar, one on Thailand, and another on Hong Kong. So we're gonna start the program today with Mimi Khan from Yangon, Myanmar's capital, who's doing a master's in international policy at Stanford, where she's a Knight Hennessy scholar. She began her activist work as a student leader in Myanmar before coming to the US. Both a poet and an activist, she's written and spoken out about human rights challenges in Myanmar, especially regarding women's rights, ethnic minority issues, and freedom of speech. She's a co-founder of the Virtual Demonstrations Movement and has been organizing both virtual and in-person rallies in the Myanmar di diaspora community, including Milk Tea Alliance rallies and global protests. Then after Mimi, our second speaker will be Jeffrey Aung, who's doing a PhD in anthropology at Columbia University in New York City. He's been writing about Burmese politics for Chuang, Spectre, and elsewhere. Keep an eye out for his forthcoming analysis of Myanmar's transition to capitalism in the third issue of Chuang. Third, we'll have Titi Jamka Jwankia, who's doing his PhD in South and Southeast Asian Studies at UC Berkeley, where he's working on anti-capitalist struggles and leftist internationalism in post-war Indonesia, trying to develop a Marxism for the global periphery. He's a member of the US-based Association for Thai Democracy and is writing on anti-royalist struggles in Thailand has appeared in Spectre. And finally, we'll have Kevin Lin, who's a member of the Laosan Collective and a frequent analyst of labor struggles in China and the protest movement in Hong Kong. So each of our participants will speak for seven minutes and then I'll facilitate a discussion among them for another 30 or so. At that point, we'll take questions from viewers. And so you can pose any questions during the event in the chat. But without further ado, let me turn it over to Mimi Kant. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Zach, for the introduction. And thank you, uh, Haymarket and uh, Spectre, for uh, giving me a chance here to speak today. As Zach has introduced, I'm a I'm a poet uh, and a writer, so I'm going to start with um, a personal story on the coup because I think we can find too many a, a lot of political analysis or uh, writings on the internet about what is happening with the current struggle. But usually, what we miss out in these analysis are these personal stories. I want to start with mine. Um, one. I found out that there they they was a coup, the military stage a coup in the country. I was I was actually celebrating a friend's birthday, and so it, it was it was a very lively moment. Uh, it was one of my best friends here at Stanford, and we were at a beach in you know in California. It was it was a, a beautiful scene, and I was actually showing 
just took out my phone to show a friend um, a video that a video that I was I was um, trying to show her. And then the moment I, I turned on the internet, all the messages just fled in, and every all of my friends are like Mimi, they has been a coup. They 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 actually have done it. And now this. It, it was just it was it was a huge shock, but then after after just settling settling in for a moment, the conversation about, about the coup has been happening for a while, and we we sort of knew in the back of our minds that this this could have happened, and 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 then when the time comes, it it almost as a reflect that this is something that um, we couldn't we couldn't take we couldn't take and this is something that we have to resist and that was that was sort of inside a lot of a lot of people's mind and I tried to contact my mom uh, right after because she's a political writer and she's one of the people who would have who would be at, at risk when the military started rounding up people couldn't contact my mom because after uh they have already shut down the internet and when uh People who have Wi-Fi can, could stay access. A large part of the country could not access the, the internet. So this is a struggle that a lot of us in the diaspora went through when when uh, when they found out about the coup. Our friends sort of came together. We had a, a few video calls. What are we gonna do? What are we? What is going to happen to uh, a lot of our lives? What is ha- going to happen to our generation? And now I grew up in Myanmar. I grew up in uh, before the. I have lived experience of the military regime right before the transition. I went to public school. I remember all those days when the generals would visit your public school, and everybody would have to pretend everything is okay. Everybody have to pretend that uh, follow along with their narratives that they are doing something good for the country, because otherwise you would be you would be put into risk. But but a lot of our students in, in, in the back of our mind, we know, and they, there's a, a feelings of disgust for, for, for these generals. And, and we have learned through the textbooks of uh, military propaganda. We have, we have known newspapers filled with uh, the military lying to us and all, all of their ridiculous narratives about, about things covering up all the atrocities that they are doing and all of that sort of come back as a, as a series of uh, series of memory once the news of the coup hit and and that shared feeling of frustration was among all of us uh, and within the country activists were coming together to figure out how they are going to resist and just like I said, it's almost as a reflex. There's a civil disobedience movement come up. The healthcare workers who were responding as first responder to COVID-19 in the country started out. We are not going to work under this illegitimate government. This is this is ridiculous. People are suffering already because of COVID and because of the economic strong economic shutdown that has um, put an impact on the country and so they walk out of the hospital other civil servants follow so so nationwide um the movement began become a huge uh, a huge resistance and street protests follow of course and uh workers and students came out on the street to continue on with the strike now this is not a, a worker strike is not not something new um even among the short window of the well, some semi, semi-democracy we have had, there have been multiple strikes um, and, and labor movement during that time as well. So, so in a, after the coup, it's just, um, even, even those who were relatively comfortable during the democracy movement say enough is enough. And now we see this a huge uh, uprising. When the uprising started, uh, we know that of course, there is going to be a crackdown. This is Myanmar military we are, we are talking about. Uh, we have had crackdowns, and, you know, um, in, as, as I can remember, in 2007, Suffering Revolution, we have had at, atrocities and, and 
an imaginable atrocity in ethnic ethnic areas, including the Rohingya genocide. And and so it's when when people start out this resistance, they know their lives are going to at, be at risk. They know they're going to be um, there's going to be bloodshed. But still, people keep on going with this resistance. And as um, currently, it's already 81 days since the coup, and the movement is still ongoing, despite hundreds have been hundreds being killed and thousands being detained. You see the creativity in resistance as well. Just yesterday, uh, people were staging a condom strike to send a strong message to the to the generals that you sh they shouldn't have been born into into this country. So now that is in, in inside the nation, but at the same time, I think this is also a a movement that is, amplifies the global layers of oppressions. You see international institutions largely paralyzed and and not caring to what is happening in Myanmar because they cannot care. And so that's that's currently where it is and when the resistance is going out on, on all fronts, not just within the national struggle, but also going into reflecting the global layers of oppressions. Thank you, Mimi. Um, and next up, we will have Jeff. Thanks, Mimi. It's really, really good opening. And thanks, thanks, Zach. And thanks all, all organizers, everyone for joining us. We also have um, little Rosie here. It's almost her bedtime. So this could be a little interesting, but let's see. I have some short remarks called um, a tactical international to three many insurrections. And it also starts with a slightly personal note. In late February, a few weeks after the coup, I found myself trading a bunch of images with my cousin in Yangon. They were circulating widely on social media at that point. They explained in Burmese things like how to build barricades, smother tear gas, deal with smoke bombs, and tend gunshot wounds. One of them was titled, How to Run, and it says to crouch lower and bend your body at your waist, shrink your body as much as you can, run into the closest houses and buildings you can see. Your life is the most important. Another talks about formations to use at demos, the barrier, the sound, the body, a ga, a then, a nya. The barriers are the frontliners, the sound, people in the middle with microphones and the body, the main group of protesters. Just some examples. The information, of course, came from comrades in Hong Kong through anonymous translation and circulation efforts. One source was a Google Doc, publicly accessible, which is called the HK19 Manual. It begins, Dear brothers and sisters in Myanmar, we are part of the resistance in Hong Kong, and we look at what is happening to you in Myanmar with concern and great sadness. We share your values and stand with you in the fight for a just and free society. Our situations are different, but you may need to steel yourselves for a protracted struggle, especially since the military seemingly has the blessing of the CCP. The manual follows with detailed information on frontliners' protective gear and weaponry, the use if also limitations, of things like Molotov cocktails and property damage, and what kind of respirators were most useful for frontliners tasked with smothering tear gas shots from the cops. The Milti Alliance is one name for the informal linkages that have emerged between the insurrections in Hong Kong, Thailand, and Myanmar. But the HK19 manual contains no mention of the Milti Alliance. And it's worth noting that this kind of sharing of tactical innovations has taken place far beyond the loose geography of milk tea. Think of state repression and police violence elsewhere. Here is Chuang writing in the wake of the brutal killing of George Floyd last year. As the movement against police brutality and the institution of the police itself unfolds across the US, we've already seen in it the marks of other riots and mass struggles that have emerged across the globe in the past year from Chile to France, Lebanon, Iraq, Ecuador, 
in Catalonia, to name but a few. Fence-like barricades, techniques for extinguishing tear gas, and the use of lasers and umbrellas loom large in the tactical repertoire that links these locations. I'm still trying to figure out how useful the milk tea notion is, given this kind of global geography of rebellion. And maybe there are others here who can, can speak to that a bit better than I can. But I do think tactics has become a privileged domain of political reflection and action in its own right, from Hong Kong to Myanmar to Chile in the US. We could think of Vietnam in the 60s, when it was the focal point for anti-imperialism in its seriality, and in its specificity, in Christopher Connery's words, referring to Che Guevara's call for two, three, many Vietnams. Global Maoism, Connery writes, citing Li Zihao, was a military Marxism, a set of tactics, strategies, where practice is not application of theory, but anterior to theory. Stance, practice, tactic, position, situation, revolution, he contends, were the key coordinates of Chinese revolutionary practice as they were in Vietnam and within the Communist Party of Burma's decades long insurgency too. At stake in global Maoism for Connery was a theory, if we can still call it that, whose effectivity was praxis. These theoretical contributions include practice as the determinant of revolutionary identity and the centrality of the peasantry as peasant wars for liberation were the vehicle of revolutionary struggle across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Today in Hong Kong, Thailand, Myanmar, and beyond, it would be difficult to identify a singular revolutionary subject, whether the peasantry, the industrial working class, or otherwise. Yet in struggle, it may be possible to forge common visions in their seriality and specificities in two, three, many insurrections. <laughs> the HK manual is not a milk tea document per se, but another one is an open letter released earlier this month. It begins, we, the undersigned activists, organizers, and allied organizations of the milk tea alliance who have led, steered, and mobilized recent and emergent protest movements against authoritarian rule and oppression across Asia and beyond, a position that Rosie shares. Call on the United Nations, ASEAN, and their member states to act firmly and independently to address the human rights, humanitarian, and political crisis that's currently unfolding in Myanmar. This opening is quite a contrast with the opening lines of the HK19 manual. <laughs> Sorry, Rosie. The manual addresses brothers and sisters engaged in common forms of struggle. The letter is an appeal to liberal principles that supposedly the UN, ASEAN, and their member states share. We might have possibly some concerns about how anti-authoritarian struggles turn so quickly towards not just the so-called international community, whatever that is, but even appeals for US support. What would it mean to think current antagonisms not in terms of couplings like anti-China, pro-US, but along common material bases. Hong Kong is a global center for finance capital, for instance, and Chinese infrastructure projects in Thailand and Myanmar, not just Belt and Road projects, aim to displace and resolve the contradictions of finance capital, especially in this post-2008 era. In some ways, these are old questions about anti-authoritarianism and anti-capitalism, about state and capital. They might lead us to ask what limitations there are to today's tactical international, if we can call it that, and what it might mean to transcend them and struggle always according to concrete material conditions. Thank you. Thank you, um, Rosie and, and also Jeff. And uh, next up we have Titi. All right, thanks. Hey, Market. Thanks, Spectre and everyone. Um, my Short remarks is called Challenging the Necropolitical State. And my presentation revolves around two questions that specifically illuminate the Thai perspective about the Burmese struggles. If I'm running out of time, I can elaborate the second question on Milk Tea Alliance and transnational solidarity during the Q&A. 
So the first question is, what are politically progressive consequences of the Burmese struggles for the Thai protesters? I have to first acknowledge my Thai comrades, Sirada K. Manitha Thai and Thanapad De Pawutikun for their on the ground and critical insights about the relations between Thai and Burmese protesters. There are three issues. First, the Thai protesters coordinated by the largest coalition, Rasadon Group, rallied with around 300 to 600 Burmese residents and workers in Bangkok exactly on February 1st, after the military takeover in the morning. The rally continued for roughly two weeks, deploying the creative protest tactics used in Burma, like hitting pots and pans or flashing light from torches or mobile phones. This would have been just simply a gesture of regional solidarity if the Thai state did not routinely treat the Burmese migrant worker as bare life and stigmatize them as COVID-19 carrier. Just in December 2020, at Samut Sakon province, where the Burmese migrant worker were most concentrated, the Thai state erected barbed wire fence to cage the subaltern workers from spreading the virus as if they were livestock, as the Marxists call it, surplus population. The Thai protesters' ready act of solidarity means they were simultaneously countering the Thai state's discursive and coercive authority. The second related point pertains to the issue of Burmese refugee at the Thai borderlands. On March 29, about 2,000 Karen minorities crossed the river to flee the Burmese army's airstrikes to the Thai border at Mae Hong Son province. The Thai authority initially provided the Karen's refuge, only to be followed by chasing them back to the displacement camp in Myanmar, where they faced continuing military rampage. Similar to the rallies with Burmese in Bangkok earlier, the more progressive Thais who I gather, once neglected about the refugee question, promptly condemned the Thai state's anti-humanitarian act. The hashtag, stop sending refugees to die, became trending following the incident. This phenomenon, despite its humanitarian failure, suggests that a certain sector of the Thai protesters understands the universal basis of the liberal democratic struggles, where the right to have life constituted primal principle, as opposed to an exclusivist parochial and ethno-nationalist understanding. These two phenomena in my reading demonstrate the growing political literacy of the Thai protesters who just a few months prior to the Burmese struggles may internalize the Thai state's necropolitical construction of the Burmese workers as bare life or just simply treated the issue as invincible, invisible and hence non-existing altogether. What remains to be seen is whether this sympathy is motivated by transnational solidarity among the oppressed or merely an instrumental understanding of surplus population replacing a necropolitical version with a biopolitical one from their life to disposable living labor. My comrade Jeff Mint, our panelist here, whose works investigate the Thai-Myanmar border for a decade, informs me, who is from Thailand's capital, Bangkok, and hence oblivious to the borderland, that the Thai tradition of taking in Burmese refugees stretches back to at least the 1988 people's uprising in Myanmar through the grassroots engaged Buddhist and humanitarian NGOs like Spirit in Education Movement. Third, the extraordinary courage and tenacity of the Burmese protesters who resist authority in the, face, in the face of death understandably became a source for boosting the Thai protesters' morale in both elevating and shaming ways. Among them, the most controversial and potentially condescending slogan was, if not resisting, then continue living like a Thai. Thai, which was claimed to be a Burmese protester utterance. The slogan conveniently adapted from the existing Thai protest slogan, if not resisting, then continue living like a slave, replacing slave with Thai. There was no evidence 
whatsoever that this slogan came from the Burmese or was a Thai fabrication. Yet what I find interesting does not lie in the slogan's origins, but the discussion is spurred among the Thais, especially on the comparison between the enabling conditions for the people's uprisings. Without a sustained discussion of such enabling conditions, the Thai agitators would just make superficial moralistic comparison that the Burmese are more courageous than the Thais who feared to die. This is not a competition of courage. We need better analytics to compare so we can draw invaluable lessons from our struggles for posterity. Many commentators simply stated the obvious by pointing out the absence of certain political actors like the monarchy and the royalist who master the art of consolidating hegemony. This hegemony in turn makes the Thai protest against both monarchy and military a less Manichaean and more internally differentiated one. This is not entirely true because there are some Burmese protesters who criticize the NLD and Suu Kyi's elitism as well. Though this criticism is not the primary cost of the people's mobilization now. The more sophisticated answer concerns the political economy of uneven capitalist development, the relationship between state and civil society, and capital and labor. Ultimately, the Thai protesters do not only demand a democratically elected government, but a total transformation of the royally dominated nation, including the military, into one that is people-led, a demand totally unexpressed in the past few decades. I would ask my Burmese comrades if they are interested in this question to tell us more about the enabling conditions and what are the generative angles of comparison from the Burmese perspective. I will use the rest of my time, very little, to talk about the second question. What can the mimetic and perplexingly popular Milk Tea Alliance tell us about the larger regional geopolitics? I only have two paragraphs. While the term tells us nearly nothing about its shared political and ideological basis, similar to many other ex inclusivist big platform assemblages. Its emphasis on formal and horizontal solidarity prompts an intense exchange of tactics, practice of interreferencing, coordinated online battle against the CCP's cancel culture and internet trolls, and distribution of media attention, as Jeff has already presented. This online infrastructure is even more pertinent and timely in the Burmese case, where the internet and phone signal were cut off. Going forward, nonetheless, I personally think that as a transnational alliance and an anti-authoritarian or anti-monopoly internationalism, the shared political and ideological basis increasingly become the definitive site of inquiry and investigation. I wish to make short three observations about the multi alliances chair political basis despite the historically specific situations that I want to test out and by no means conclude from. I merely aim to start a conversation. Let me just say briefly what they are and I can elaborate more during the Q&A. First is the main enemy taking form of fundamentalist militarism. Second, the milk teasters living the legacies and history of unfinished decolonization. And third, the opposition to Chinese violent uses of coercive and consensual forces. Thank you. Thank you, Titi. And next up, our final speaker will be Kevin. Thanks, Tech. Uh, and thanks also for uh, Spectre and Haymarket for hosting this event. Uh, also, thank you, uh, Megan, actually on the background with the logistics and uh, really appreciate uh, Mimi, Jeff, uh, and TT, your analysis, and also your personal stories. Uh, and of course, I want to express my solidarity with the people of Myanmar who are so brave and determined uh, in their resistance. And of course, all of all the more uh, the recent Asian uprisings, uh, this is definitely the most brutal one to date. Um, yeah, thank you for your bravery and for, for all your work uh, in organizing solidarity. Um, for me, um, I approach and try to understand what's happening in Myanmar from my own sort of two inter intersecting interests in, in one in labor movement, specifically the Chinese labor movement, uh, and second, the Hong Kong protest uh, movement of 2019. So let me offer uh, three brief observations and thoughts uh, from a somewhat comparative perspective. 
first, I, I think the the it was so clear from the very very start and and all through the entire uh, movement in Myanmar, the role of unions and organized labor actions has been so instrumental in resisting uh, the authoritarian uh, rule. And uh, you know, in the case in comparison, in the case of Hong Kong, uh, despite uh, general uh, calls, repeated calls for general strikes. Uh, there was fairly limited industrial action taken, for example, by the flight attendance unions in Hong Kong back in 2019. Uh, Trade union mobilization overall was much less than was hoped in Hong Kong back in 2019. Um, so despite very militant street protests, the, the lack of industrial action uh, did not disrupt critical parts of the economy in the ways that Myanmar workers uh, have done. So in a way, you know, looking at uh, seeing what's happening in Myanmar, uh, it, it is just it's something that we have hoped for, definitely, um, that could, you know, would have happened in the case of Hong Kong as well. So, you know, especially the, the very militant struggles by uh, the government workers uh, uh, in Myanmar. Uh, and I think there, there is definitely original dynamics here that I, you know, uh, that you would take a lot more, lot longer to to uh, unpack and elaborate. Here, I want to just highlight a couple of things. One thing, is, of course, that the fact that industrial action uh, did not take off in the same way that Myanmar did is Hong Kong's economy has long been deindustrialized. Uh, industrial production, uh, for example, in garment sector, was relocated to to mainland China, among other places like Thailand, for example, in the 1980s and 1990s which gave rise to a labor movement in mainland China, but at the same time, it means the industrial struggle and strength of trade union movement in Hong Kong has been very weak, uh, except for some uh, white color professional unions. It is of course also divided politically by two rival trade union federation, one in which is uh, pro-establishment and the other is in the democratic camp. Um, since the late 19, uh, 2019, there has been a unionizing drive in Hong Kong uh, which is a very deliberate, conscious strategy to extend the movement beyond the street protest. And in the process, new unions emerged. Uh, they set up lots of new members, but it's also facing tremendous difficulties in continuing to organize workers, especially uh, around workplace issues. So it, it, has be, it has been easy, fairly easy to sign up new members um, for those new unions, but it has been challenging to try to build workers' power from the ground up. Uh, and of course, partly because of the political uh, environment in Hong Kong that has been deteriorating uh, so much so much worse and so much so, uh, so much quickly that anyone has anticipated. But also, of course, building workers' power will need a long time. Um, then on the, across the border uh, in mainland China, the industrial labor struggle has been very strong for the better part of the last 20 years. Uh, but in a way, the, the lack of a democratic space to organize the workers' own unions has meant that tens of thousands of wildcat strike each year in mainland China for almost two, dec two decades, never developed their own mass workers' organizations, and they never cohered into a organized national movement. So despite the, the, the regularity of workers' actions, uh, there is really no a national labor movement in China to speak of. And of course, in the case of Myanmar, we see both a rising labor movement, especially in the in the booming garment sector, uh, but also, uh, I guess, li very limited and very problematic, but limited democratic space uh, in the last few years for labor organizing to, to take place. So that has led to, you know, this massive uh, workers organizing, among other reasons uh, in Myanmar that we haven't seen in some other places. Second, um, Looking uh, across the region and looking at the sort of predominantly youth-led movement uh, of the recent years, not just in Asia, you know, across the world, one reflection I have uh, is simply that never dismiss young people. Um, certainly, certainly in Hong Kong, while people used to think young people, uh, the young people in Hong Kong were so apathetic and apolitical, they would never take interest in social and political issues. But of course, the last few years, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, ever since the umbrella movement of 2014, have really proved how quickly young uh, people can become politicized and radicalized uh, in the space, in the span of uh, just a few years. Uh, so I, I will, in the same sense, I will also not dismiss the potential power of young people uh, in mainland China. 
uh, I think contrary to this uh, return of this totalitarian image of Chinese society, and which is real in many ways, there is um, uh, 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 very harsh repression, and there's also uh, very um, close surveillance of uh, of people's you know speech and organizing, etc. Nevertheless, you know we saw in the brief window opportunity uh, uh, last year in the first few months of the pandemic, when there was a lot of chaos and and the Chinese government uh, were was now able to respond uh, quickly and, and adequately to the pandemic. You saw young people, you saw people in general, but young people in particular, quickly uh, organize themselves and mobilize to set up mutual aid initiatives uh, to support both themselves and, and each other. Uh, this is despite years of repression, of course, of restriction or for any serious organizing in China. Uh, but again, uh, uh, thanks to the logic of capitalism, the increasing inequality, uh, shrinking job opportunities and stagnating incomes, which is a phenomenon that we see in so many of the protest movements that have happened in the last few years, have created more and more generalized discontent uh, among young people in China. Uh, of course, it has not manifested in a large scale mobilization, but I think when it does finally mobilize and struggle for fair and just society, uh, it will not only be a very exporting movement in China, but I think it will also have a lot of uh, implications beyond, beyond China. Um, so finally, uh, I, I want to, uh, and I think, you, I guess you, you probably see where I'm going with this. Uh, I want to say a few couple of words about, uh, a few words about solidarity, regional solidarity as the previous speakers ha have also highlighted. Um, I think the challenge is really to, to find ways to build connections among youth in the region and build solidarity uh, uh, across, uh, across different countries, specific around progressive agendas. I think there's a natural tendency, and I think Jeff uh, mentioned, you know, the the handbook, and there's I think there's a very natural tendency for uh, uh, movement activists to look to each other for inspiration and give solidarity. I think that's been really, really important. But I also want to sort of think of more a bit, and that's maybe more to Titi's point about what a progressive agenda or or even more radical agenda uh, against both uh, political authoritarianism but also capitalism. How do we build around a, say, a transnational Asian social movements that are uh, both anti-authoritarian and anti-capitalist? Uh, of course, I will finish with this. I think it would require two things, uh, which are interlinked. One is of our connect collective analysis of not just similarities and differences between uh, the protest movement of different countries, but also the regional dy dynamics, as, as TT has also highlighted. Uh, especially no, both you know in terms of economic relations, for example, Chinese investment or Korean investment or Japanese investment, uh, but also in terms of uh, political influences uh, and diffusion in this, in this region. That's one. Uh, and connected to that is kind of really the the what's important, and that's in the in the article or or in the interview rather that Jeff did for Spectre, right? Is that deep contextualization of the history of uh, each country. I think that, that history and also political and radical tradition is really important to, to rescue and highlight so that you know movement like, like that we see in Myanmar, in Hong Kong, in Thailand and elsewhere do not appear coming out of nowhere. And finally, of course, we want to take seriously about how the different movement interconnect and intersect, right? Through the diffu diffusion of tactics, but maybe more so than that, uh, maybe there is is ideas, ideologies uh, that, that is, goes beyond uh, purely tactical questions. And of course, most importantly, I, I look forward to uh, creating more communications, networks, and infrastructure of dissent that could continue the conversation that we started today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so now I had a, a couple of questions I wanted to pose to, to all of you. Um, so Kevin, you talked a little bit just now about how Hong Kong's trajectory of deindustrialization produced a very specific composition of the movement. And I was interested more broadly if people could talk about the, the class composition of these various movements. And I'm wondering in particular what role workers play in each of these struggles. So, you know, one extreme, I suppose you could say in Hong Kong that, that protesters don't seem to participate as workers, but then at the other extreme in Myanmar, the role of organized labor seems to be key. And so I'm wondering if this is an accurate reading or, or really 
what role workers play in, in each of these struggles and what other class fractions are involved. I can I can jump in, I guess. Um, sure, sure. Well, just to kind of rehearse some some facts that I think people are kind of might be generally aware of already. But um, I mean, as you say, organized labor was absolutely crucial in kind of swelling mass demonstrations in kind of the first week or two after the coup in February. Um, there was also, um, of course, this kind of general strike that was first led by public sector workers, um, sort of talking about kind of health workers, um, but but other kinds of public sector workers as well, teachers, um, people working at banks. Um, but as as kind of repression uh, ramped up, actually, um, in the, in a sense, another kind of version of the the sort of labor question played out, at least in Yangon, where. Um, as security forces kind of reclaimed central areas, um, mass demonstrations kind of shifted to industrial um, outskirts. So Langdaya, which of course is kind of the largest concentration of factories in Myanmar, um, but North Okolaba as well, another industrial area. Um, there were, were massive crackdowns uh, in these areas, um, which um, kind of attacked um, kind of worker-led demonstrations that I think I think it would be fair to say were a little bit less directly tied to the institutions of organized labor and were um, a little bit more kind of decentralized. Um, but you could also argue that those forms of repression kind of revealed uh, something that maybe people are still a little bit sort of struggling to come to come to grips with, which is just the kind of the fact may be that in Yangon, um, the industrial workforce was um, arguably the backbone of the urban resistance. On the other hand, of course, the industrial workforce in, in Myanmar is um, not huge. Uh, there is this kind of booming garment sector, as Kevin pointed out, um, but elsewhere in the country, um, the country is, remains massively rural. Um, there are kind of important urban rural linkages. I mean, even after the crackdown in Langdaya, a lot of workers um, went back to rural areas. And so there are these kinds of relations of social reproduction, you could say, where rural areas kind of, um, it's a familiar story, right, but um, sort of subsidize industrialization in the, in the cities. Um, so I wouldn't want to sort of reinforce urban rural distinctions too much, but just to say that um, this kind of mass resistance that we've seen has been far beyond Yangon. So we, we do see this kind of uh, absolutely essential role for the industrial workforce in Yangon, but the kind of defiance that we've seen is really, I mean, it's really been across the country from Putao in the far south to Kotao in the south, Putao is in the north, sorry, Kotao in the south. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I think it's difficult to say that sort of overall um, we could sort of trace the center of this resistance to um, industrial workers. I, I think that would be a difficult claim to make, but in Yangon, absolutely. Yeah, and what about in, in these other contexts? I mean, when we think about Thailand and, and Hong Kong, who's involved here in these protests? In terms of, of class composition. I can jump in to say a little about why it's so difficult to answer this question in terms of the labor composition of the protesters. Um, I have to say, I think in Thailand, after the um, the destruction of the student movement, which were also involved with the um, organ co-organizing with the Thai Communist Party in late 1970s, uh, the government um, executed the uh, processes of deunionization de and de-radicalization of the left which go together with the building of royal hegemony since the 1980s. And that is why it is so difficult to, um, even though there are, I think, many workers and peasants um, in Thailand also working for transnational company, but uh, the idea of labor itself has been erased. And uh, there has no 
so far as I know, uh, sort of more sustaining left organizing from the bottom up uh, in Thailand to talk about the concept of labor once again. And I think it's only recently that that idea has been brought back because of, I think, some of the organizers in campus learning about all these Marxist theory from, you know, uh, their leftist professors, and they start to do this organizing again, and then goes to the uh, context of the union itself. From the latest research that I have read, um, it is reported that only one to two percent of all workers in Thailand are unionized. And within one to two percent of those unionized workers, more are actually uh, inclined towards, you know, the Menshevik type reform rather than being revolutionary. So there are also within the unions, there are also internal conflicts and union busting from inside and outside. Uh, but the one which are quite active um, politically are also on the move. I think uh, it's it was Haymarket. I think that invited one of the um, labor organizer, female labor organizer, Lake Pachani, uh, to join in the um, uh, uh, discussion as well, I think a few months ago. And from what I have heard uh, for, you know, the general, the odd, the general um, sort of uh, response towards the idea of strike, it went sounds as even the strike worker strikes of any kind, uh, even for, whether it's in factory or outside factory, whether it's office worker, sounds so improbable in Thailand. It sounds so impolite. And there's lots of discussion about, you know, whether like doing political protesting stuff needs to be considered about the politeness and the politeness of who. And I think that is somehow um, one of the topic or one of the issue that among the organizers that we think that maybe because we have been um, sort of doing the protests too politely uh, in the past few decades because of this kind of royal hegemony, but you know, it's just like pinpointing to like what is what 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 makes it impossible. Um, but anyways, that is to say my thoughts on why talking about uh, the labor question is not as easy. And I think many who are sympathetic to the question of labor are on the move and trying to organize since. If I can just quickly jump in for, for me one minute. Uh, to yes. like, uh, oh, to say, uh, I mean, in, in the case of Hong Kong, it's overwhelmingly very young students, high school, uh, university students, uh, in terms of workers, uh, very uh, big proportion are in the service sector. Uh, waitress, uh, waiters and waitresses, uh, and some are uh, in the art sector, and um, I, and I think you know you see the same problem that the TT uh, mentioned in the context of Thailand is is even though there are you know still a lot of unions, uh, mostly very small, but there's still unions in Hong Kong. But first of all, there's really no industrial working class, uh, not much left anyway in Hong Kong. Uh, second of all, the, the, there's really not a very strong industrial industrial tradition in, in recent decades in terms of taking industrial actions. Uh, there have been very few big strikes uh, in, in in Hong Kong. So when the calls for general strike came, you know, many many times in the course of the movement in 19, 2019, a lot of it seemed very abstract. It, it is without really much organizing. It is you know, a call was issued for a general strike. But the groundwork was not really prepared. So all that is to say, I think there is this, you know, if you think about the, the Asian context in general, you know, the sort of decline of, in a lot of places, the decline of unions or left-wing parties, uh, and also, you know, as a result of anti-communism, and, and in some places because of the industrialization, et cetera, et cetera, really mean that the union in the region overall have not been very strong. In some places, they are stronger than others. But overall, we, we do definitely see a crisis of, you know, trade unionism or, or just labor in general, that even though workers do come to onto the street in mass numbers, they don't, they very often do not do so uh, as organized labor. Great, thanks. Um, you know, I, I know a number of you expressed some ambivalence about the National League for Democracy in your comments, and I was wondering in particular about the role of, of political parties in these various movements. So, you know, there seems to be this 
this openly anti-party sentiment in both Thailand and Hong Kong, but a potential link to, to a party, the NLD, um, in the Burmese case. So, of course, it's, it's a very fraught relationship. And so I'm wondering how important political parties are to each of these struggles and what role parties are playing. I can jump in about the National League for Democracy part. In terms of Myanmar, uh, the movement in Myanmar, even though it is true that the National League for Democracy and LNLC parties, they have a huge support inside the country, except from, um, from the group of um, working for ethnic minorities and liberation or uh, mainly radicalized youth. I think the, the social movement itself started against uh, the military regime. Even in, I, I think the political party, the support for political party is stay important and you see people uh, demanding to release their leaders, um, demanding to respect their votes. But at the same time, I think people are now calling for something beyond the National League for Democracy. I think I think throughout over the course of the social movement, it started. I mean, it started out with when you see the people who started first striking. Those were the student unions uh, and um, and the labor unions largely organized. And many of the many of the activists who first started um, the strikes have also been critical of the National League for Democracy. So, for example, Itin Zaman was one of the, uh, she was one of the three people who criticized NLD by saying there's a genocide and changed my mind. And so you see these, you you see more of, a, a, more in the sense of people mobilizing against um, this authoritarianism rather um Rather than the link to the political party, at least that's how that's how I see it. But at the same time, uh, you also see a lot of radicalized youth talking uh, specifically about the the NLD's authoritarianism itself, and within the last uh, few years, in terms of cracking down on the activists talking about civil war, or also talking about um, the arrest that happened during that time window. So there's also that conversation ongoing. I, I think it's true that uh, we cannot discount um, the fact that people, even in the diaspora, uh, stay associate the movement for democracy with the National League for Democracy. But at the same time, I think through over the course of the, uh, the past 81 days, People have learned to realize that it started, I think it's only the beginning of the process when um, the past mistakes of the NLD itself has been, been also realized. And a lot of the radical radicalized youth also have the avenue to speak more about um, the larger struggle um, that is beyond uh, just putting NLD back into power. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's that's really really well put. Um, there there is this kind of um, this sort of reexamination of of the National League for Democracy and how sort of central they should or shouldn't be to um, kind of popular politics, let's say, in the country. Um, I think in in a lot of the coverage of the coup, there has been this sort of um, familiar story told where it's a question of kind of embattled liberal democracy up against authoritarianism. Uh, which is a story that that overlooks in many ways um, not just the sort of changing contours of this kind of mass resistance in the country, which which is, I think it's fair to say, starting to push beyond that kind of attachment to the NLD. Um, but I think it's also a misreading of actually the NLD's period in power, um, where, um, I mean, as, as Mimi would know really well, I mean, the, the student movement was one center of, of um, really sort of critical social movement um, during that period. Uh, the NLD had very poor relations with a lot of kind of popular political struggles in the country. They understood themselves to be sort of the vehicle for kind of politics as such in many ways and really alienated a lot of, you know, from sort of formal civil society organizations to kind of more grassroots political struggles. Um, 
There were also um, strike wave after strike wave in the industrial zones during the NLD government, um, which would suggest, I think, in many ways that we might not necessarily want to see what's been happening in the country as a kind of attempt to restore bourgeois democracy, right? I mean, even from the kind of earliest days and and now, of course, um, I hope at least we're sort of really pushing beyond that. So someone has just posed a, a follow-up question that I know um, I haven't fully opened it up to, to audience questions yet, but I actually think this would be be really instructive here. So someone asked whether this new, this newly proposed national unity government represents an evolution of the NLD, um, whether it's moving beyond a kind of liberal or neoliberal party, or is it uh, more of the same? So just wondering what, what you guys think about this, this national unity government. Uh, I'll jump in on that as well. I, the current national unity government, I would say is a, a slight improvement of what the NLD party was, but I wouldn't say it's an evolution uh, from what it was before. You, we see a lot more younger, um, people in the in the unity government which a lot of a lot of you activists have been pushing for 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 many years we also see um many ethnic leaders and also uh women in in, in this national unity government but at the same time i think we have to sort of gauge whether they're still they are only playing the surface of the identity politics or whether they, the leaders of the CRPH and uh, the who founded this national unity government fully understand the struggles and demands that are playing out by by in, in this social movement. And and that's a hard question to answer because you see people like Dr. Wimya A. Um, and Dr. Mama Mew, who were largely very problematic while during their response to the Rohingya crisis. And and, and so, so it, it is a question, um, obviously, to be observed as well as they are, they are now uh, starting to starting out their, uh, the process. But I don't think, I think it would be a stretch to say it is an evolution from, from the NLD. Uh, I think, I think they have received receive um, a lot of the demands from the people, especially from the radicalized youth, to transform uh, the previous leadership into this national unity government. But at the same time, um, a lot of the questions of whether we will fundamentally change the structure of NLD has been uh, dismissed. And it's, it's yet to see whether whether they will come in terms with um, the oppressions of, say, the Burma majority and really understand the full uh, struggles of a lot of the young people and a lot of the radicalized youth that are in the country and also multi layers of oppression that have been in the countries. Um, and so it is largely yet to be seen, but I don't think I don't think it's an evolution. Great. And I wanted to ask uh, another question um, before we turn to audience questions, just about the, um, again, about the composition of, of the protests in Myanmar. Um, I'm, in, I'm particularly interested in, in the ethnic composition. And so, you know, we've heard a bit about how um, both urban and, and rural struggles of the majority Bamar population have begun to link up um, with some of the, the long running ethnic insurgencies. And I'm wondering to what extent this is this is true and what these links look like. So how some of the ethnic minority struggles, um, Mimi just mentioned Rohingya, we could um, talk about quite a few here and Karen and Kachin. And, and to what extent these ethnic minority struggles are actively linking up with with majority Bamar protesters. Yeah, I, I can I can maybe um take a stab at that. I mean, it's, it's, I still think it's relatively early to say on that front. Um, I mean, the national unity government, I think, raises some of these questions of sort of um, inclusivity um, that, that you also point to. Um, so, I, I mean, I think some of these, these issues are coming a little bit more to the fore. We've also seen um, in a kind of total replay of earlier uprisings, I mean, 88 um, in particular, where we have kind of urban protesters who've shifted to um, 
uh, territory held by ethnic armed organizations. Um, so in, in Eastern Myanmar, for example, in, in Kenyan state, um, there is there is this kind of um, very sort of tangible linkage, I guess you could say. Um, on the other hand, uh, there there's still, I, I think, an outstanding question of maybe um, uh, relationships between different armed organizations themselves. Um, I mean, over the years, um, this, this will be sort of obvious for, for some, some listeners at least, but um, there have been kind of any number of attempts to forge um, ethnic alliances uh, that would then sort of come together to uh, resist the, the kind of lowland Burman military. Um, and these have consistently kind of fallen apart for one reason or another. Um, in, some, in some cases, very good reasons, because different armed groups have very different politics, very different histories, actually, and they're kind of good reasons why some might not want to kind of stand shoulder to shoulder with others. Um, but this question of sort of um, ethnic solidarity is, is a sort of uh, is a heavy one and it's a difficult one. Um, but the, the national union government does appear to be trying to build some relationships with leaders in, in ethnic minority areas. So there might be um, some sort of cause for optimism. But uh, I mean, as Mimi just pointed out, um, it's still, you could say, I mean, it's super early on the, on the national union government itself. Um, and with some of the people they've appointed, the uh, early signs are not necessarily encouraging. Um, some of their kind of overt political statements as well um, have also sort of used and, and reinforced this kind of language of national races or um, which officially continues to exclude Rohingya people, for example. So um, there are, I, I think it would be fair to say, sort of fundamental questions that remain um, uh, uh, relatively unexamined at this point. Great. And, um, you know, I was going to ask you about the, the Milk Tea Alliance, but we've just gotten a, a question um, where someone asked the other panelists to respond to Titi's provocation about uh, the Milk Tea Alliance and the question of incomplete decolonization. But more broadly, I might ask, um, your thoughts on, on the Milk Tea Alliance, how, how strategically useful you find it, and so forth. Because I know a number of you, especially um, some of our later speakers, um, mentioned it somewhat ambivalently, it seemed. Others of you I know are, are quite involved. And so just wondering what you make about the Milk Tea Alliance. Um, maybe it's helpful to just let me finish that line of yeah, thought. Yeah. On colonialism so then people would have like more time to think about it so I'll just read out what I have prepared uh, on this question of um, uh, uh, unfinished decolonization so what I, I what I have written uh, is going as follows the milk tea stirs to all to a different extent in my reading lift the uneven legacy of unfinished decolonization and even juggle between different imperial regimes the old British liberal empire Cold War American anti-communist neo-colonialism, and what we may call, and this is sort of my experiment, Chinese neo-tributarianism, if imperialism is such a problematic term to many Chinese analysts. Some of milk teasters are fighting the imperial centers, and some the local elitist manifestation of these imperial powers in a comprador bourgeois form, or both. Some also oppose their states on colonialisms, settler, franchise, and internal. The reality, of course, is always more complex than abstract generalization. For example, Thailand, in my assessment, is, in my assessment, decolonizing from the Cold War internal colonial structure, namely the monarchy and the military, cemented by the anti-communist American power. Yet, the post-Cold -war, post War twist and amnesia is that now the military government is oriented towards China and accusing the Thai protester for being backed by the US. While structurally, the militaristic illiberalism was a US creation in the first place. It is an aporia of peripheral countries to straddle between different imperial centers unless fuller anti-capitalist decolonization is achieved. So that's my thought. So, you know, I'm wondering um, whether whether the others want to respond to TT or or else even to go beyond and think about 
whether you find the Milk Tea Alliance strategically useful. I think um, the, the Milk Tea Alliance, I mean, it hasn't, it has only been very recent that this sort of uh, the space of the Milk Tea Alliance is, um, is coming in shape. And I think um, what is useful, um, if you ask, is it's sort of the organic solidarity that has that has been forming and starting from say the manual to um just people sharing each other tactics and people helping out each other and even up to an extent of showing just um uh, just showing the fact that uh people are standing together and i think that's where um that's where um it has been useful i think and I think right now we don't, we're not, it, it's kind of a vague idea, right? You know, what is Milk Tea Alliance? Like who is involved? Or what what kind of identity is Milk Tea Alliance shaping? Um, like um, Joff was saying in his, state, in his statement about this, the letter, like is it going to be uh, appealing to the international community? I was actually um, in, I was actually involved in the space that drafted the letter, and and uh, when the open letter was start, started out, it's actually intended to as a protest against the international community, international order, rather than appealing to it, if that makes sense. Because we know that even though we send out these open letters, nobody is going to listen because uh, if, if we look at the current order, it's, it's a continuation of colonial exploitation and, and uh, dominance from the hegemons. Uh, but at the same time, I think it is that the importance is that uh, we have friends who, who are Jill and who are uh, oppressed in, in, in Thailand. We have people, we have our activists who are on hunger strike at the moment. And and we have the same we see in Hong Kong as the national security law um, situation getting getting worse. And we, we see activists and um, a lot of uh, protesters getting oppressed even more. And and I and the space sort of opened up to all of these activists who have been uh, mobilizing and organizing since the uh, four years to come to a space and also open up to a lot of other people who are just recently radicalized in the social movement in the region. Um, and so, so then I think it's also a, a moving and just sort of starting to form a space that is starting to form. And in, in Myanmar, uh, as you see, a lot of the people are still calling for the international community to respond. And because, and 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 I think it's it's it's, it's valid in the sense because if they say that they if they say that they are these entity um, and compass of human rights, that's something that they have to do. And now people are starting to, um, you know, we we start talking about abolishing ASEAN. Uh, and so, you, so so that it has come to a point. So it's, it's, it's a moving and evolving kind of space. So we just have to see where, it, where this movement goes along, I think. But I think what is really important about the space is coming together organically without anyone trying to form it. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, the, the way you describe it, I think it's fair to say it's a sort of. Um, I mean, one way of one way of describing it would be as a kind of it's a contradictory formation that that kind of consists of multiple strands, to put it um, maybe in a slightly uh, kind of stilted way. Um, there, from what I can see, I mean, there there, there is a certain amount of um, sort of liberal discourse and, and kind of liberal politics, um, as well as more. Um, sort of leftist, um, sort of leftist strands within it as well. I mean, for me, that as as I sort of spoke about before, that kind of tactical exchange is it's probably the most interesting for me, at least. It's um, uh, maybe the most sort of effective or useful um, part of what has come to be known as the Milk Tea Alliance. Um, for that as well, I, I I do sort of wonder why why not? I mean, because the, the, there is this sort of much broader sharing of tactics, right? I mean, um, from Hong Kong um, to uh, elsewhere in the world. I mean, um, in Chile, it was very obvious. Um, in Portland, in the U.S., very obvious. Elsewhere in the U.S., too. Um, so I'm not, I'm, I, 
I I wouldn't want to sort of rush to kind of um, um, sort of concretize a sort of regional formation in that sense when there is this sort of like much broader kind of geography of rebellion and um, so I mean that's that's just that's that's sort of how I've been kind of struggling with the concept but um, but absolutely I mean as as he says I mean it's it's sort of um, it's a growing and changing. Um, Kind of uh, kind of thing, and and it and it and it does point to this kind of organic solidarity, which um, I think would be um, something that's not something that we could really dismiss. I mean, that's definitely really important. So, uh, oh. no, sorry. Yeah, I, I, Go ahead. Oh, wait, wait, again, very quickly. It just you know, I, it was just really great to to hear uh, what others have say, have to say on this. Um, I think I think just very quickly on you know as the city mentioned before I think obviously Hong Kong and as uh, Mimi has mentioned as well I think Hong Kong is in this special place right it, it has to uh, grapple with the, the British colonial legacy for for more than hundred years it is dealing with uh, uh, Chinese political influences right now uh, and it's also caught up in U.S. China rivalry. Uh, so it's kind of in this kind of almost impossible place, um, you know, I, and and so politically it it gets really complicated, and, and especially for you know that you know for the diaspora organizing, right? For example, in the U.S., for example, the Los Angeles Collective, where a lot of interesting discussions happens about Hong, around Hong Kong, you know, um, it gets it gets very challenging when you take it to the broader sort of Hong Kong diaspora. Or the Chinese diaspora, right? Because um, because of the the ongoing U.S.-China rivalry, so so it is very just very fraught political terrain to to navigate. Uh, but I, I I just very quickly on the uh, Milk Tea Alliance, I I also just interested to 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 see how it developed because that that organic solidarity is there, it's real, it's it's gonna go on, or it's gonna develop the way it's gonna develop. I'm all thinking about. If we think, you know, if we want to more, even more, push it more to the progressive direction, is there a room for that? And, and if so, you know, what what is there to do? Because I, I think there is certainly in the Hong Kong case, right? Because Hong Kong, the Hong Kong protest of 2019 is all about u- unity. So in name unity, we do not dis- dis- uh, do not open uh, up or air out disagreement openly uh, in the, for for risk of splitting up the movement. Uh, but they also gave that movement a depoliticized character uh, that is in some ways very problematic. In some way, it gives strength, but in other ways, problematic. So I'm, you know, I'll certainly want to hear more from Mimi in the future about the multi alliance, how it develops, and also what is the political program uh, beyond the, the tactical sharing that that is already going on. Great, and we're getting. Um a number of questions around the question of anti-imperialism, and I know um, Kevin raised the question of, of campism. Some of these are, are um, posed quite critically, some of them are quite sympathetic, but one, one person asks um, how each of you balance these two demands. On the one hand, the need to raise international awareness and pressure, on the other, anti-imperialism. Um, you know, another way that this question was posed, I think, some somewhat more confrontationally, was you know in the Hong Kong case that Joshua Wong and other other um, so-called leaders of the Hong Kong protest been meeting with heads of state in the U.S. like like Mike Pompeo. Do Hong Kong people actually follow these leaders? So you know we're getting different variants of of the same question here. But the question of of anti-imperialism, the China-U.S. rivalry, etc. And so wondering what you guys make of this. I know it's a, a third rail of sorts, but we're getting quite a few of these. I, I guess I can go uh, first. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 I will really say it's the failure of international left um, that, that we're seeing, you know, uh, protests, uh, no, activists in Hong Kong look to uh, the conservative uh, or the right-wing elements 
uh, in the US and in the UK. I mean, not, not entirely, I have to say. I think a lot of them actually uh, talk to both, for example, in the US, talk to both Democrats and Republicans. But I think, you know, when you're calling a very politically fraught position, and, and if you're in Hong Kong and you're, you're in the movement, and you look internationally, where do you see help coming from? And there's not a lot of places uh, that carry any weight. So, so the, the other, this other side of the question is, is where else to look to? Um, and and uh, where is the, the more progressive uh, government or the more progressive political party that can give support? Uh, they often don't exist in a lot of places. So people are left very, very, with very few choices. And I think that does pose the question, right? So what, what can we do, right? Like what, I, and that's very, you know, in the US context, I guess a lot of our uh, audience would be from the US is, you know, in the context of, of um, for example, DSA, uh, there's a certain tendency within DSA to simply say, let's not even say anything bad about any state that is the uh, official enemy of the, of the US. Uh, and that's just shuts down the conversation. So imagine a Hong Kong activist, or you could be an activist from elsewhere, come to the U.S. and looking for support, and all they're getting is, "Sorry, we're not going to talk about uh, Hong Kong because you know we don't want to uh, criticize it the same way that the right wing in the U.S. criticized China." Where do you think they will turn? Uh, so I mean, I can say more about this, but I, I will just end here. I can also jump in on that question, and I think, I think this. Is a dilemma that I also personally have, right? Uh, what there after after the coup, there are also a lot of advocacy campaign and a lot of advocacy on the U.S. side when people are trying to, you know, talk to the representative or talk to Congress or senator on on doing something on Myanmar. But I think personally, it is more you. There are just a lot of thoughts processes that that comes into mind after after you see um, these layers of anti-imperialism, while at the same time a lot of the people and a lot of uh, even your own communities are are appealing to this um, imperialist structure again. And there there are um, a small group of a small group of um, young people in Myanmar who are pushing for the fact that this is something that we have to take into our own hands. This is this 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 the success of this movement, the um, our triumph of the triumph of this revolution is not going to be coming from this international community. It's something that we have to take into our own hands and achieve it by ourselves. And I think that's the more powerful message than say activists meeting with you know congressmen or whatnot. But at the same at the same time I think I think we also have to understand that this is as violence increase, like there's a humanitarian crisis there, a lot of help that people need. And I think in, in one way is um there are a sack of a, a sect of people and there is also um a group of I think it's probably even a larger group of people who are appealing to this international community and um, and you know the imperialist structure um, because I think a lot of people think it's a more pragmatic approach. But I think there's a um, there's a powerful advocacy going on for on the fact that this is this is our revolution. We are together with each other. And this is something we have to put forward. But I think that's still a dilemma that people have, and it's, it's an ongoing struggle. And and I think, um, like like Kevin has said before, is the failure on the international left um, in terms of the fact that there's a, there's a large group of people who is still appealing to the imperialist structure. Yeah, I. I think I have I have two thoughts. I mean, the the first is that um, I, I I mean there there's a, a kind of in a way a kind of openly pro imperial politics that has taken shape around um, this kind of mass resistance in in Myanmar. And um, personally, I think that should be condemned. I think there's various ways of condemning it. You could call it a sort of honest conversation about whether to what extent we could sort of realistically expect. 
um, any form of U.S. or U.N. intervention from R2P to Security Council or otherwise. Um, or or there, there are other forms of condemnation as well. I mean, um, but I, I think one one form it could take is that, I mean, and, and I'm, I'm happy to sort of field um, disagreements on this, but I'm not sure that pragmatism, um, and not that, not that Mimi herself has taken that position, but it's true that, that that is often the justification for this kind of politics is that it's a pragmatic politics, but how pragmatic is it really? Um, I, personally, I'm, I'm not convinced at all that it's pragmatic. Um, since roughly the kind of 1988 uprising, um, which happened at a certain kind of historical moment, right, with the kind of fall of the Soviet Union and these sort of um, color revolutions and so on, um, there has been this kind of, this way in which sort of popular political struggles in Myanmar have been continually sort of put into this box of a kind of struggle for liberal democracy. And um, I think it's worth thinking beyond that a little bit. And, and one way of thinking beyond that is just that, um, I mean, and this is sort of a slightly contrarian position maybe, but um, I, I'm, I'm genuinely just not sure that that sort of, um, those sort of uh, kind of elitist sort of international civil society kind of strategies, um, I'm not sure they work. I'm not sure they matter. Um, so when, when people ask me what, what can be done internationally, I, I, I usually say, I'm not sure very much can be done actually. Um, because it really does come down to, uh, in my view, at least, sort of mass defiance in, in the cities, towns, and villages of Myanmar. And so let's say something like um, a security count, a form, some form of security council action comes through. I mean, how much traction would that have without sort of ordinary people flooding the streets every day, every day, every day in Myanmar? I don't think it would have very much traction. Um, so I, 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 think, I think there's sort of a lot to... to Oh, sorry, I, I think Jeff froze. Um, let me jump in here with, with one final question. Um, we only have about two minutes left, and so I just want to pose it very quickly, just because I really want to get this in here. Turning back to the domestic politics of, of Myanmar. Um, so someone asks, the National Unity Government wants to keep the army, but have it follow a different master. That amounts to keeping the same dog on a different leash. Why aren't there more calls to abolish the military as such? So any reactions in the, in the Burmese case? I think I think goes for, for both uh, the question of appealing to the liberal order and also to abolish the military itself. I think there is a I think there is a, a, a group of people who are aware of this uh, the problems in terms of the militarization, the problems in, in the current struggle, and and I think mainly on the on the front of the student unions who are calling for uh, abolitionist uh, struggles, but I think I think I think at the same time uh, a lot of them, a lot of the people who are calling for that kind of resistance have also had a lot of backlash. Um, so I think it, it's it's going to be a struggle of how much they can advocate for uh, in terms of that struggle and how the movement is going to evolve from now on. I think, yeah. Great. So, um, well, thanks, uh, Mimi, Jeff, Titi, and Kevin for a really, really great discussion. Um, I hope we can keep it going in, in the near future. We're unfortunately out of time. so. Thanks to Haymarket for making this event possible and providing tech support. You know, we really couldn't do it without you. Um, thanks to Spectre for putting this event on. I just wanted to mention that, that none of Spectre's editors get paid and we work hard to keep content flowing on both our website and in the print journal. So if you haven't yet subscribed, please do. Um, for just $35 a year, you can become a subscriber by going to spectrejournal.com, British spelling of Spectre. Or if you already subscribe and want to help us stay afloat, uh, every little donation helps, and it really, really does. So on behalf of everyone at Spectre, I want to thank you for tuning in and for supporting us. Um, the next issue is going to be mailed out in just a few short weeks. It features urgent analysis of the struggles at Amazon in Alabama, questions of eco-socialism after the pandemic, and much, much more. So finally, I want to thank, again, all four of our speakers today for making this work across three continents. We couldn't do it without you. 
Um, thanks to everyone for tuning in and let the struggle continue.